back to horror queers we're talking avant-garde performance pieces we're talking seedy vampire clubs and we're talking candy who will melt in your mouth and in your hand i'm joe and i'm trace and we're talking fight scenes set to the song volare which will have a connection to something that joe is gonna hate later when we talk about that scene god are you gonna sing again no but it's really funny i promise you'll you'll get a good laugh out of it so (laughs) okay that's fine i'm good with that i I really need to start preparing for those and i never do so i just make them up on the fly but we are talking (laughs) vamp everybody and as joe rightfully pointed out to me today um we are not talking about amy heckerling's film vamps that came out a couple years ago um we are talking about richard wank's 1986 vampire buddy comedy proto from dust till dawn movie vamp (laughs) <laughs> with the tongue pop apparently yeah that's how you say it um <laughs> <laughs> but before oh actually oh sorry um and some of y'all if y'all listen to our episode on nightmare on elm street 2 so I- i'll let y'all in on a dirty little secret i had never heard of this movie before i had no idea what the fuck it was until we did our live episode on nightmare on elm street 2 because as some of you may remember if you listened to that episode uh robert russell was a guest he was on stage with us and he kept talking about doing cocaine with grace jones on the set of vamp and i was like all right never heard of that whatever keep talking so put this movie in a whole new light when i finally got to see it Hmm. yeah this must have just been a crazy set to have been on it looked so much fun i i really enjoyed this movie but before we really get into our opinions We do have a guest today. Um, So, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between, you may know him as the voice of Tad Strange in the second season of Gravity Falls, but you probably know him by now as the narrator of the documentary Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street, because that's been out for a couple weeks by the time this episode drops. Um, Oh, and he also narrates this tiny little podcast called Welcome to Night Vale, a twice-monthly fiction podcast in the style of community updates for the fictional small desert town of Night Vale. Please welcome Cecil Baldwin. Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome. He's doing the voice. He's doing the voice. No, this is just my voice, you guys. It's just my voice. <laughs> I So I was listening to some episodes of Night Vale at work today because, full confession, I'm so sorry. I had never listened to the show before. But it's I fine. Felt... The internet remembers everything. It's all right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and Trace is also terrible. As we've, you know, confirmed, he's never heard of Vamp. He's never listened to Night Vale. You're just a babe in the woods. Well, I mean, I knew what it was, but I never sought it out. Um, but no, I, I listened to some episodes today and I was like, oh my God, that voice. What is that? So before I got on today, I was like, is he, is that what he really sounds like? Or is he like, you know, doing a bit for it? I don't know, but I like it. No, that's just my voice. Well, I mean, it is a bit, but it's also, I'm just talking. But I'm also like talking into a microphone in my living room, just like I would if you were sitting in my living room. But it sounds super dramatic when I do it into a microphone. That's it. That, yes. It's it's very, very entertaining, I must say. I was like listening to it at work and I was like, this is, this, okay. Oh, hey, Sorry, it's kind of cut- sexy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's Tony Todd, and then you. I had a I had a waitress tell me once that that I sounded like uh, whiskey and caramel, and my boyfriend at the time was just like, "You own that." It's like take that and run with it. <laughs> take it to the bank. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was like, "Thanks, man." So I, I might cut this out. I don't know, but so when I was graduating college, I graduated with a degree in public relations, and I did an internship at this PR company. And one of our clients was this thing called Beckenfield. And it was something kind of similar to, uh, to Night Vale, where it was like they had this fake town called Beckenfield and they had a general outline of a story. But rather than it being a podcast or like, you know, one person kind of doing the radio stuff, they let anyone join the website, join Beckenfield, make up their own character and then post videos as whatever character they had. And then they would like... Wow. Pro- they would send them like town newsletters every week to give them like prompts of like what they could do with their characters. 
It's like a live action Sims. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. You're like really slow Sims. <laughs> yes. It obviously did not take off because no one is talking about that because this would have been back in like 2010, 20, eh, 2011, 2012. But yeah. So I just like, so when I was start, started listening to the show, I was like, this is just like that fucking thing that I did back in college. That's cool. <laughs> Only on a much larger scale. Yeah. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> but it just started, it started off small as well. I mean, like literally when I started Night Vale with Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner, like, you know, I, I think they gave me two episodes. It was like the pilot and then the next one. And the reason I got into it was because I I, I didn't listen to podcasts. I, I thought podcasts were recorded like in a pod somewhere, <laughs> like in the back of like a truck or something. Um, Why are they called pods, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, so, but I was interested in the like, the spookiness of it. The like, because that was my fandom, you know. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know this american life cool cool I, I yeah i totally listen to that but in fact i was like oh my god this scene is just like some cronenberg like body disaster like attacking this guy at his work i was like that's what i was in for you know when i when i got in with night vale yeah but the difference is is that you're often doing it by yourself and you're having to embody all these multiple characters like i've when I first started doing podcasts, I immediately understood I could never do it by myself because I need someone to banter with. Like, I wouldn't want to listen to me for any length of time. So I always yeah. think, okay, <clears throat> Ooh, I'm going to die. That's it. That's it. <laughs> See, you need, a, you need a buddy to come in and be like, what you meant was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Also, call 911. I just murdered myself. <laughs> well, I think I could do it by myself. Bruce Greenwood himself told me when I interviewed him that I had a voice for radio. And I was like, thanks. Nice. And that was nice. before I was podcasting. So I mean, better than nice. a face for there radio. You go. I know, right? Yeah. Oh, no. A dangerous version of that. <laughs> I'm adorable. I, I, if someone told me that, I'd, I'd brush that off. Like, water up a duck's back. <laughs> so, okay. So, yes. We are talking vamp, everybody. And I hope that you all watched it. If you didn't, obviously, as per usual, we're going to take you through a very long, lengthy, but entertaining plot summary. If you haven't watched it and you want to, it is streaming on Amazon Prime. I paid $3 for it last night. So, and it's worth the $3 if I made me three whole so. dollars. Yep. Um, although I think Arrow, I think Arrow has a Blu-ray of it. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Very pretty colors. Uh, much like every scene in this movie. Uh, God bless the 80s and neon. Now, wait, now, wait. Can I throw out a conspiracy theory, like, right off the bat? Go ahead. Oh, absolutely. So, can can either of you tell me what year did, did Beetlejuice come out? Uh, do you know if it came out before or after this movie? Because on a third watch, fourth watch, whatever of this movie... This movie is so like poor man's Beetlejuice. So th this came this came out two years prior to Beetlejuice because Beetlejuice yeah. is eighty eight. Oh shit! So maybe like you know I don't know this is it influence. is it yeah well, is it an influence of Tim Burton? Maybe. Question mark? Well, because well, I mean, obviously people it's a lot of magenta and green and I want a lot a lot of magenta and green and yes. a lot of like really slopey camera angles like yes. at one point we were like oh my god the actors are gonna fall right off the stage <laughs> <laughs> well and like like the, the easy comparison here is you know you see like the lights you're like oh it's like giallo even though nothing about this narrative is very giallo-y um, <laughs> yeah. but then it's also coming in uh, two years after Fright Night so I, I did describe this as Fright Night light because a that, lot of I was, this yeah 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 it's in that same like comedy horror like the horror's pretty gruesome but the mm -hmm. comedy is also pretty funny mm -hmm. and the makeup affects themselves too i didn't look to see who did the effects for this but the vampires like once they vamp out like it looks yeah. very much like um amanda beers when she goes crazy in fright night oh. yeah that and night of the demons and i can only say that because i only just recently watched it but there's something about mid to late 80s special effects particularly when it comes to teeth and fangs mm -hmm. they all have a similar low budget but very yeah. I don't know, endearing quality to them. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's just something that you wouldn't see now. I mean, we all know. We would have terrible effects. Uh, and when we talk about effects, also like the contact lenses were I think oh, the yeah. real star mm -hmm. of this film in many ways. Um, also <laughs> the score, which is the most 80s -y score that I have heard <laughs> in a very long time. It's all good. It's all great. <laughs> Um, before we like dive into like just like, I mean, basic release, because uh, by the way, y'all, this film flopped with everyone. <laughs> Boo. This apparently does have a very large queer following, and y'all, I'm gonna play the dumb one here because I don't know much about it. But would y'all call this an overtly queer horror film? I would. That's why I suggested it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's true. Um, Joe, do you remember what we had on on deck beforehand before Cecil made us change it? 
<laughs> uh, probably How something less <laughs> fun. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually, yeah, we, we had, um, yeah, clearly we didn't care about it because we switched it out. So, okay. Yeah, like well, you had some cool, you had some cool movies coming up, but I was like, I was just like, huh. Oh, I don't know if that's really like a. I, I see queer, no vampire. You know? What is, what is <laughs> happening? <laughs> well, and 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 for me, I re like for, don't, don't feel bad about not seeing it because seriously, I like had to rediscover this movie this past Halloween. Oh, really? Okay. And I mean, like, I think this was an up all night movie for me. You know, like USA up all night. It was mm-hmm. on, and like you know, and and you never quite saw a all the movie because there was no boobies and there's no like super gory stuff on USA say not even at 2 a.m and and b it was like all chopped up and you're you know i was like a teenager and shit i wasn't paying attention um so i don't think i saw this movie beginning to end and then this past halloween i was i gave it a watch i was like oh my god what where the where my little gay soul has been crying out for this for like years how did i overlook it I will say, yeah, I'm actually genuinely surprised that this doesn't have a bigger following now than, like, I mean, because, you know, because of the internet, uh, a lot of films that were buried when they were released in the 70s and 80s are finding a new audience. Yeah. And even with an aerial Blu-ray, like, I'm just, I'm surprised that this isn't talked about more because this, honestly, to pair this with Fright Night, or if you really want to go there, pair it with From Dust Till Dawn, like, it's mm-hmm. it fits in right with that mold. And it's super fun, breezy. It's like a, it's a good, like, background movie but you also want to sit there and pay attention to it yeah yeah because there are some hidden gems that if you do actually listen there's some there's some there's some fun stuff in there Mm -hmm. yeah particularly with the comedy right i mean some of the action is a little familiar i feel like the reason maybe it hasn't caught on a if people are dumb and they don't know who grace jones is like that was the reason that i came to this film that's the only reason i knew it so when robert Russler was talking about it i was like oh yes the grace jones film haven't seen it but know about it okay i'm gonna show my age here so the only reason i know who grace jones is is because when i was a kid of the 90s i was playing goldeneye on n64 and her character from a view to a kill mayday was a bonus character that you could get and so <laughs> fair fair i i would play as grace jones as mayday in this game never having seen a view to a kill never having any idea of who she was and that's how i found out who grace jones was Conan the Destroyer, the second, the second Conan. I've only no? seen Marcus Nispel's remake of Conan. Oh Conan. God! Oh, oh ew! Oh. Ew! Watch the first one. The first, the cinematography in the first one is fucking unbelievable. Like it's really, really kind of a weirdly beautiful film. Duly noted. But I will tell you right now. So I think Rustler is very charming in this. I think uh, the guy that plays Keith, Chris Makepeace, is. Fine. Yeah. Oh, you mean Samwise? Samwise? Samwise Gamgee? Yes. Oh my God. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Every time he came on the screen, I was like, Frodo, no. Um, but my <laughs> my MVP of this film, who I, I was just like watching her, and I was like, I love her. Is Dee Dee Pfeiffer? She's fucking. She's great in this, she's right? So charismatic, so lovely. I literally t- I messaged Joe when I was watching. I was like, how is she not more famous? Because she is so good in this movie. <laughs> oh, because she has a sister that also. I- <laughs> is Michelle the, keeps her locked in, in, in the basement the sh- in the show business oh, God. yeah <laughs> and but no like and I see I didn't even know that until um like today where I was like looking over the cast I was like wait is that oh my god it is yep. and like as a sibling of a celebrity person like that's pretty that's pretty talented if you'd like don't immediately look like your fame more famous sibling mm-hmm. you know and also you're like can hold your own in like a schlocky B movie <laughs> like vamp. Yeah. I think she's made a career out of TV, which Joe seems to be a trend with us the past couple weeks, mm-hmm. but yeah, no, she, she's kept steady work, but I have literally never heard of her until the, and yeah, until like this week. I literally yeah. didn't even know Michelle Pfeiffer had a sister. <laughs> when you sent me that, you were like, man, Dee Dee Pfeiffer. And I'm like, am I supposed to know who this is? And then you were like, Michelle's sister? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, that wasn't me expecting Mrs. you. Mrs. Catwoman? Mrs. Cat, 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 cat sister? sister? Cat sister? No? Oh my god, can we get a movie called Cat Sister starring <laughs> Dee Dee Pfeiffer? And, How amazing would that be? No, and Michelle Pfeiffer is an aging Selena Kyle, and like, oh, Dee Dee brilliant. comes in and it's like her protege or something. But <gasps> Wait, do they solve mysteries? <gasps> oh, yes. <gasps> yes, yes, yes! 
Okay, are we just remaking the musical Cats right now with Michelle Pfeiffer, though? Ew. Is that <laughs> okay, we, we might want to step away from that ledge? Step away from the ledge. You call no, you call it Cat Women, Cat Woman's, and cat it's just cat Cats but with all bunch of Michelle. Oh, oh no, it's it's gonna be cat well. Women's. Obviously, this is like a, any any scenario, but like we have Eartha Kitt risen from the dead. Mm-hmm. We have Julie Newmar. We mm-hmm. have Anne Hathaway. We have mm-hmm. uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. Who else mm-hmm. play Catwoman? Um, whoever voiced her in the cartoons, sure, do that. All right, sorry. So, yes, vamp. <laughs> Wait, who are we? Where are it's we? It's going to be like this all night, kids. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, vamp was released on July 18th, 1986 by New World Pictures. And I will tell you this right now. I feel so bad for this company because the only movie I associate with them is Heather's, which also wow. flopped. I was going to yeah. say, they gone under, right? They have definitely gone under. Okay. <laughs> but, I mean, like, both of these movies, maybe Heather's people have come to appreciate, but maybe this movie was just ahead, too ahead of its time. Maybe. <laughs> Actually, I have I I'm working with this this idea that this is like the showgirls of horror in a lot of ways. I mean, I'm gonna make <gasps> a showgirls reference later on. Yeah, like I don't know why, but my subconscious is like, okay, except they're you know like when we get into like plot and all that. Yeah, um, the plot, 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 but. There's some, well, there's some similarities. <laughs> well, hey, so hey, well, no, that, that's a good. So hey, we got a runtime of 93 minutes, but in terms of reception, I mean, again, it's an older movie, so like Rotten Tomatoes isn't going to be too reliable. But we're looking at a 29 percent on Rotten Tomatoes with an average score of 4.48 out of 10. This movie was panned when it came out, and I gotta say, I I don't think this is a bad movie that like you know, is entertaining. I mean, it's not one that I would call a great movie, but I I think it's a legitimately good film, to be honest. So I think I can understand and maybe elucidate why it has that bad reception. I think it's just because it's, it's like five different films in one. So, Correct. you know, I, <laughs> I love the idea of a it all happens in one kind of night and we're just on a wacky adventure. Like I saw one review from a, a site that called it an adventures and babysitting kind of film with vampires. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yes, that totally makes sense because they're just traveling from location to location, getting into a bit of a wacky hijink and then coming back. But I can also see people not liking that and saying this film feels unfocused it's trying to pack in too much like why can't it just settle down and kind of tell a story a little bit so i think that's my thought is that people looked at this and they didn't see the fun in going to all these different locations they just thought oh it's unfocused i also think that that probably this movie came out in a time where uh you know the sort of the meatpacking district or like you know soho in new york city was uh probably like not where America's bread was buttered at that time, you know, mm. like, oh, like um, I, I kept thinking of that movie After Hours, the Scorsese movie in which, you know, hapless guy with normal desk job gets lost in the strange underworld of the gritty New York City yeah. around the same time. And I think that movie did not do well either, you know, or it's just like it wasn't, you know, the stuff of like schlocky b movie like you know horror flicks you know um this movie i think was kind of like shooting for the stars a little bit and maybe just ended up looking really really fucking fierce while they did it but they didn't (laughs) really quite get there i i will say that i i think i prefer the first half of this movie to the second half because once keith is kind of running from locale to locale to locale and we're just spending time with him that's i was almost checking out at that point yeah yeah but then we get um, Allison back in, and it's like, all fine. Yeah. Well, that's part of the problem, right, is that he's not the most interesting character in this film. So Protagonist I, syndrome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. But I do think it's interesting, too, that kind of like what you said, Cecil, is there's an interesting, maybe even slightly problematic class critique that we could apply to this film. I don't think at the time it would have been as obvious, but looking through this in modern eyes, I was very much like oh, wow, this is a, like, affluent white people don't go to the big city because (laughs) racial minorities may bite you and kill you. Oh, yeah, you think? (laughs) I mean, like, like in in giving it, like, 
uh, second watch. I think they're from Princeton. Like I, you know, like because okay, so we're talking about like different. This movie is like seven different movies in yeah. one. Yeah. Um. I mean, if you think about it from like the very opening shot, it's already a fake out, right? Mm-hmm. It's the whole initiation sequence, and you think you're watching. You know, you're like, oh my god, this movie is called Vamp. It's going to be old timey vampires, and it turns out to be a fraternity initiation on some exceedingly wealthy Ivy League like yeah. campus right so they're gonna go into the city to get some hookers i will tell you mm-hmm. that i was worried so w- when it was revealed that it was a frat thing i was like oh god so okay. here, I, here we go i, I didn't I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I didn't yeah. know what this was about i did not know anything about this movie i walked in and totally then you blind. remembered frat boys usually means some if not full frontal nudity at least some like good eye candy some tidy whitey action yeah there's some and this movie delivers on that front i would yeah. say yeah oh, but also casual homophobia and also like i'm not really a fan of watching yeah. two dude bros go around and yeah. run around so i was actually happy that this movie subverted those expectations and right. i genuinely liked these two guys yeah oh and no wait 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 hold on before we say these two guys because there's actually a third guy in there oh which yeah which is actor getty watanabe who mm-hmm. which like in second like again in like giving this another watch in 2019 2020 i was just like wait this is the man who played long duck dong yeah. in 16 candles and like was kind of the symbol of America's like racism. exceptionally exceptional yeah. racism. Yeah. You know, that was like Hollywood kind of champion during this time. And here he is. Not only is he not playing the Asian guy, capital mm-hmm. V, capital A, capital G, he's like the rich asshole nerd that the two, like he has an actual character and his like race doesn't come into it. And he actually gets to be funny. Like, he's not playing a stereotype. He's like, you kind of get the feeling he's like the clown on set. And I was like, yes, get it, man. I, I do think the movie forgets about him. It does. That's oh, actually that, that the, is true. the capital thing is that <laughs> yeah. you're just like, you built up all of these great secondary characters mm-hmm. and yeah. then you stuck us with the boring straight white guy. <laughs> yeah. You also created like what could have been like one of the most epically fucking fierce like vampire queens in history Mm -hmm. and you won i mean like this is a huge thing she does not speak a single i found that very problematic word see i actually kind of liked (laughs) i like she's so strong and powerful she doesn't even need to talk she's just got her acolytes yeah like we'll we'll talk about it when we get to the scene but there's a part where like she like uh vic the, the 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 lackey guy is like talking to her and she's just looking at him, and he gets what she's communicating mm-hmm. immediately because she's, she's motherfucking a, Grace she's Jones. Motherfucking yes. Grace Jones. I was just about to say that. <laughs> I mean, because I, 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 I don't know the backstory. Like, I don't know if they had Grace Jones and they built the part around her, or if they had the part and then they cast her. So, so, but there's that. Like, she doesn't speak, but also she doesn't do anything. Yeah. Well, no, she blows her load early because honestly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no like we see her full face like yeah. face crack of the century like we suck we see her face like 20 minutes in and then Absolutely. she disappears and then has an epic death and that's kind of it yeah which by the time you know, she shows back up you've almost forgotten she's even in the movie and yeah. joe are you glad that i warned you about that because had you expected grace jones the movie i think you would have walked away disappointed yeah well uh, so i don't know did either one of you watch the trailer for this no i did not so I didn't, but I read in reviews where people said, yeah, this is definitely a case of mistaken marketing where yeah. they totally made her front and center. And you can obviously see this on the poster where it's yeah. literally yeah. her fucking face. And then, of course, the final film is like, no, we bait and switch you. But also, yeah. I do love that they bait and switch us with like this fucking fierce, iconic black woman. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah, you got you sold this on her. You didn't sell it on the two white guys. All right. So before we go into the plot, just really quick, um, this movie, I couldn't find the budget for it. I I don't imagine it was that big, but it opened at number 13 with $2.2 million and went on to gross total $4.9 million. This was a critical and commercial flop uh, doomed to be forgotten by everyone until today. (laughs) <laughs> until the gays <laughs> oh um and on letterbox it's got a score of six out of ten so people at least are kind to it well i feel like if you watch this film and you enjoy fun then it's going to be a good time for you <laughs> if you hate fun and you hate christmas and puppies and everything you won't like this movie <laughs> exactly 
That is exactly what I'm saying. So, as mentioned, after a failed hazing ritual, Keith, Chris Makepeace, and AJ, Robert Russler, pledged to find a stripper for the, for the fraternity party that night. Rewind. Mm-hmm. I liked the hazing sequence with the tape fucking up. I thought because yeah, because yeah. you think you think it's it's non diegetic music and then it's like oh wait no they're actually playing a tape of this fucking Omen style score <laughs> yeah well even when you see the the main guy and he's got the rope burn around his neck and you're thinking oh okay I guess we are talking about ancient fraternities and yeah. then it's like now nah, he's <laughs> he's just some dickwad <laughs> well and also what comes out in this scene is like this kind of like reversal of expectations is for the first time in a while you've got the two initiates that are seemingly so much cooler than the actual fraternity they're joining. Mm -hmm. They're like, they kind of, these two guys, and I think it's like a great acting choice to be like, um, this sucks. You all are suck as a fraternity. You'd be lucky to have us, and we're going to prove it to you by showing you, like, how things are done. And I will reiterate, I I know that Robert Russell was typecast as this kind of, like, this type of character. A hot asshole. Well, no, but... He actually looks like he belongs on, like, a beach towel. You know, like, like the, the, like, the sun, you know, like, on a spray bottle of, like, suntan, like, in this. You know? Like, sexy Joe Piscopo. He does a good job of not being an asshole, though. Like, I, I didn't find him as, like like rude or like i didn't dislike him in this movie i i liked his he was character. he was a rich white guy he's rich yes. he is he is rich white guy mm-hmm. i mean he's basically playing grady from nightmare 2 i haven't seen weird science in a very long time so i don't remember who he plays in that movie oh i think i think in like i think in nightmare on elm street 2 like he definitely did that like pop collar kind of like i'm the be- i'm off on the wrong side of tracks versus this guy is a little more like this guy's a bit more smooth talker but you're yeah. he's not an asshole he's a bart simpson he's like a bart He's like, because, you know, that's that was like that whole nuclear family, you know, like kind of shit was in the air at the time. Well, like, that's s- what people were looking up for. He could smooth talk his way into me any day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we know, Trace. He can wreck you inside. Got it. <laughs> ba, 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 ba. Um, okay. <laughs> One of the things that I also like about this, and it reminded me, so Cecil, you wouldn't know this because we're recording this before it comes out. But uh, so we, we just watched The Blob and we talked talked a lot about how that movie does a great job of subverting expectations about who you think is the main character and this opening scene really does that same thing where you think that AJ is your protagonist because he's mm-hmm. smooth talking he's the one taking the lead he's making all the plans and Keith seems like the person most likely to wind up getting murdered by a seductive woman because he's too dumb to play the game yeah he's he's the sidekick yeah he seems like a sidekick and AJ seems like the boss man so i will not lie this would have been a better movie i think had that actually happened so you wanted them to play it like we expected well i mean like have keith get killed and out of the movie for most of it and then have aj be in more of the movie so a little more fright night sure yeah (laughs) actually no that no i mean the comparisons to fright night are kind of hard so i'm not gonna harp on it but like it's definitely a very like charlie evil ed relationship here only a little bit less gay porny with evil ed yeah Maybe. Who knows what Chris Makepeace has been up to these last, you know, three decades. Listeners, (laughs) tell us. (laughs) Chris Makepeace, reach out. Reach out and touch (laughs) us. Okay, so they decide, okay, we need to get strippers for this fraternity party, but we don't have a car. So they hit up wealthy but lonely Duncan, who is played by Getty Watanabe. And I have a question. Mm Mm-hmm. He looks like he is running some kind of side hustle out of this giant <laughs> dorm room. And I would like you both to speculate, what is he up to? Uh, listen, I don't know, because I was just literally screaming, technology, computers, <laughs> cell phones. Like, oh, my God, the 80s technology in in their scenes, sort of like in the frat scenes, are mm-hmm. fucking great. I was like, that computer's the size of my apartment. Look at that thing. <laughs> It requires eight people to man it. <laughs> oh my god! Like at one point, he pulls off like the printer sheets that actually had the like dot matrix, oh, like yes, like yes, the yes, little yes. the little holes on the side that you'd have to pull off separately. I was mm-hmm. like, man, how did we live? How did what that was eighties were nuts. 
<laughs> so Trace, you wouldn't remember any of that, but it was he was a born. Party. Were, you, were, you, were you born with a smartphone in your hand? I, <laughs> I was. Uh, fuck you. I was born in 1989. I I am 31 years old. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Anyway, so I wasn't sold on the movie yet by this point. So I oh, wasn't. No. Yeah. I I just I literally just thought that. He just rented cars out to people. <laughs> I thought that's okay. what he did. And I think this is like one of the first times where, like, listen, these guys, these actually, these three actors are pretty talented. Like, mm-hmm. they handle this snappy dialogue, quote yeah. unquote, pretty well. But the actual plot is kind of lost in the shuffle. Like, later, they're like making jokes. They're like, yeah, you owe me six coffees. And I was like, what the fuck do you owe him? Six? Oh, it's like they, they pull a classic. I don't know. It's very like eighties in its plot. It's like, you know, be our friend for a week. Yeah. And I'll yeah. give you my car because that's how you get popular in the eighties. If you're at Princeton or and something. see, I'm just thinking about, she's all that. Like we made a bet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's the classic, like, like we're in very well-worn, very well-worn, like Porky's yeah. revenge of the nerds territory here. But what I love about this movie is that, if you don't like that movie, just wait 10 minutes. It'll be a totally different movie in just a few moments. Literally, all of this stuff that takes place at the university, it you could almost do away with it and just be like, these three kids need to go to the strip club and begin movie. Oh, oh, but they have more. It's uh, like there's always there's always an every hero myth, you know, like you, before Ulysses goes out on the fucking Odyssey, you got to have the home life so you know what they're like gonna come back to you know like when shit hits the fan like why they're gonna run back to the suburbs you know what's important too to set this up that they don't exactly have the hmm, they don't have the real world knowledge to maybe survive in unexpected territory right like to them the biggest deal is we need to get into this fraternity which means we need to get a car like that is the extent of their problems so then to compound that when they actually get to the city and experience actual problems oh, yeah. just kind of makes their journey well, that much when they experience joyful. problems and then they experience like you know like like Egyptian vampire death goddess <laughs> level problems, you know, which will not be elaborated on just speculated. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So they make this deal with Duncan where they are going to take his car in exchange for a week of friendship, but he also gets to come along for the trip, which so. is a fair, that's fair. Uh, yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, also, there's a great sequence in the car where, like, you see uh, Duncan, like, do, like, again, like, very 80s, like, tropey, like, head raise into the camera and go, oh, man. And we're just like, we're like, is he doing coke in the car? I mean, How decadent. They might be, to be honest. Yeah, well, and it then that's, the but it's never talked about. It's just, like, a momentary gag that's, like, if you know, and to me, this is, like, the definition of camp, right? Where it's, like, I know that you know that wing, wing. I know what that means. But <laughs> yeah. this chick over here, that dude over here that are watching this in 1980, whatever, they don't know that I know that you know that I know what I just did. <laughs> and so like, if you, if you're in on the joke, there's, there's like lots of little stuff like that throughout the movie. Yeah. Well, the eighties love to bury more adult themes in their more family friendly entertainment. Not that yeah. this is exactly family friendly, but it's well, I mean, clearly it's the Reagan era. For... Like right, this is like, you know, gosh, you don't do bad things in public. Everybody's running for office these days, you know. Exactly. And, you know, white America to be trusted. Ugh, of course. Wave of the future. <laughs> Okay, so they are going to go on this road trip to the big city, and they almost immediately run afoul of a trio. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Okay. Before we move on to that. You are worse than he is. Oh, oh, listen, <laughs> I, have, I have opinions. <laughs> I have been saving them. <laughs> no, okay, so. This is my outlet. <laughs> this, is, this is what I get right here. Um, so as a New Yorker, all this takes place in New York, right? This is the worst New York City I have seen since Miss Midnight Mystery Meat Train, okay? <laughs> oh god. Like I don't know if you remember that one. Oh, I know what it is. <laughs> if they're like they're like you can you know they're like above ground for 2 minutes and then they're like let's go to the subway. Here we are, 23rd Street and then suddenly they're in LA. 
<laughs> question mark you know i was like okay poor i couldn't even figure out what city they were meant to be in. it it is i i i, I think it's a composite actually I'm like because when they're driving up to the city it looks a lot like southern california and then they get to the city and it looks a lot like downtown la and then they kind of like pull back into like a half-assed like world trade towers but they're not even the real world trade it's just like two large buildings yeah that kind of look like the, it's so this is i think this is one of the problems is that they got like crazy new york performance artists and actors and then they just like shot everything in la yeah this yeah no th this was not it was all filmed in los angeles mostly on um the interiors were filmed in renmar studios in hollywood mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah exteriors were absolutely filmed in la worst new york ever like, they should have just knighted the comet in it and said, yeah, it's in Los Angeles. And I guess the issue is right? that you're probably not going to have a lot of sewer stuff in Los Angeles. Sewer stuff. And also and also this is like, you know, when we get into like the Studio 54 analogies and stuff like that existed pretty exclusively in New York. Like that was a scene. You know? Funny story, though. They so they filmed this in January and February 1986. The last day of filming was February 27th, 1986. So we are now mm. ninety. Oh, we are now thirty-four years to the day because we are recording this on what? February twenty-seventh, past the on the last day of filming. Hail Grace Jones. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I remember that. Oh my god, uh, uh, she oh. probably doesn't remember anything about this movie. <laughs> I bet she does. I bet she has some really good. Oh, although I bet she has memories of like not being able to see uh, through no. contact lenses. Oh, yeah, you know, like or like fucking... scratching Robert Russell's oh, leg with god. those fake extension toenails. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, some of the effects you were like, "Oh, that's a good three hours in a makeup chair, isn't it?" Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> not to mention the body paint. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, the body paint, so good. Okay, yeah, so they are in New York, <clears throat> and they end up passing a little bit of time in a dive restaurant because they have to wait for the strip club to open after dark, because it's literally called the After Dark Club. <laughs> <laughs> and they end up running afoul of this trio of switchblade-wielding thugs. Which I thought they were vampires. I thought they were yes. the vampires. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they are. No, they're not. No, no they're not. They they're just thugs. No, they don't. Are and they're also, sure? but they're also yes. like a weak ass gang. Like this is like the gang that like got ejected from the Warriors because like the other gangs ate them. You know, no, because the, the joke is because you think that the woman sucking on the Twizzler, like she's given it head, is a vampire because of right. her teeth. But in fact, she just has bad teeth, which she is just why, got janky teeth, which yeah. is why she gets so upset. But I will tell you, the guy that plays Snow is that his mm -hmm. name? Snow, yeah, Snow. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um. I don't know if y'all watched Charmed growing up, but, I mean, growing up, when y'all were, like, you know, old in the 90s. Like, Charmed original flavor. Yes, original flavor, not the remake. He played this demon called Barnabas on Charmed, and so it's, he, he, he looks like a weird cross between David Bowie and a snake. And also, yeah, and like, and, and like, but also a little bit of, a little bit of Andy Warhol. Like yes. he's that he's but he's like David Bowie, Andy Warhol, like like um, and also he looks like that actor John Hurt is what I thought, Ooh, you know, yes. like he's like a young, <laughs> crazy British person that could just like fucking freak out on you like psycho psycho, but also be like, where's my scarf, darling? I need my scarf. You yeah, know, like, like the really narrow nose hole slits and like really kind of like thin eyes. Like it just yeah. looks kind of menacing. Yeah, yeah. could vampire junkie gang yes. member or just New Yorker uh, or. Oh. All the above except for All Vampire of Joe. <laughs> well, I say that because I saw a bunch of different reviews that kept mentioning rival vampire gangs. So those people did not watch the movie, and mm -hmm. their reviews are invalidated. Trash. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in that case, throw out that previous reference to Adventures in Babysitting, then. <laughs> So anyway, they get it. They get into some trouble, and of course, it's started by Keith, and it's finished by AJ. And Duncan spends the whole time in the bathroom. So that's another one of these subversive. Haha! You think you know what role all of these people are going to play, and you don't. Yeah. And I have my Disney connection. Um, oh, this this fight scene is set to the song Volare. <laughs> And the only reason I know what that song is is if because you say motherfucking Lizzie McGuire movie I'll in the Lizzie McGuire the movie. Oh my god! Wow. <laughs> Vitamin C does a cover wow. of Volare for the Lizzie McGuire movie soundtrack for a scene when her and Paolo are driving through Rome on a Vespa. 
Okay, the only reason I will allow this ridiculousness to continue... <laughs> We were doing so well, and now you keep bringing it back up. And the only reason I'll allow it to pass this time is because you mentioned vitamin C. Yeah, I mean, what is what is a Lizzie McGuire? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> what, is, what, on. Is, we just what is what is a vitamin movie? C? <laughs> I, I think we're gonna have to make the Lizzie McGuire movie like a Patreon episode one day to like really give the listeners what they want. Am I Lizzie McGuire? <laughs> Do you Are have an alternate personality who does a Girl, fake show in Rome? You don't even fucking know. <laughs> I, uh, I should probably scratch that. You don't that. even know. I, I, actually, that's kind of my job. <laughs> you are an actor like oh, the Lizzie right, McGuire. Right. Oh, <laughs> Lizzie McGuire. <laughs> well, okay. So, so tangent off of Valari, because that's a really valid point. Like, okay. So you've got, okay, we've now entered movie number four, mm-hmm. which is The Goodfellas. Like, we're kind of getting out, like, into this sort of, like, hey, yo, New York. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. hey, I'm just trying to run a bar here. Yeah, there's crazies and vampires up in here. You know, like this, which, as like, again, as a New Yorker, I'm like, oh, these extras mm-hmm. are terrible actors. <laughs> but hilariously so. Like, there's, like, a, there's like throughout, when we get to, like, movie number six, there's we're in this, like, weird like italian ma, you know like it's mm-hmm. like these are this is what america thought shady nightlife figures but like ma and pa owned by the mob yeah. shady new york yeah like they're just like kind of italian grandpas you know that that are just like hey you know uh, we cling to our religion in order to be safe and uh but you know we go <laughs> it's, it's after dark so we got to get out of here yeah don't let the albino gang member come in here. That's right. Yeah. Although he's pretty, that gang is pretty fucking weak, admittedly. You know. They are. I mean, without their switchblades, they're not. And a lot of trouble. they are gone for like another hour. <laughs> Nine, yeah, exactly. You forget they exist <laughs> until they come back as a not important at all plot point. Nope. Right. Well, they they show up to save them when they need saving. They need wheels or something. Yeah. So yeah, that vitamin C Lizard Wire song finishes, oh and then God. they go to the strip club. Yes, the saddest strip club I have maybe okay. ever seen. Yeah. When, when you said the yeah. extras were bad, I was like, they clearly realized that because they yeah. obviously shot this film in order, and then they got rid of their extras, which is yeah. why this the strip club is so barren. It's it's so barren. It's also like that kind of bar that, like I th- I thought at one point they kind of make a reference. They're like, is it closing time? Mm-hmm. This is like they're like like the guys like kicking a drunk out at one point. I'm like, why is there no one here? Yeah. This is weird. But then like. Um, you know, we're we're thrust pretty quickly into the star of the show, though. Yeah, this yeah. is true. Well, no, because right away we we get Allison right away. I'm sorry, Amaretto, Amaretto. <laughs> Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like they established their plot, you know, of like, they're like, oh, and which is actually kind of a cool relationship of the is she, isn't she? Yeah. I, kind I, of thing. I, I love her playfulness. Like the scene where it just shows her spinning the bottle and she's like, get it, get it, get it. <laughs> It's it's such an endearing moment for her character. I just want to hang out with her so bad. Yeah, because you're like, does she actually know him, or does she, is she running a game? Is she like like is she a, like a psychopath? Is she a va- like what? You yeah, know, what's you know, her game? I thought she was gonna be a vampire for a good chunk of the beginning. Because the movie keeps making you think that she is. Mm-hmm. They keep going right. back and forth and saying like, oh, no, she is playing a long con. Oh, no, she actually is. And she's not going to be able to go in the sun. Oh, no, she is going to try to kill him when yeah. they go into yeah. the ammunition store. Perhaps perhaps a, a couple times a little bit too far. Where you're just like, oh, Jesus Christ. Just like we have get... accepted her as our leading uh, lady. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, let them live. Yeah. Or at least, like, pick pick one. <laughs> Now, I know that you guys want to get to this main event, Ugh. but I do need to help set the scene. So in case right, people right. have not seen Vamp, you need to think of an industrial warehouse that's populated solely by people who are on last call all night long. That they all look like they have porn mustaches yep. or like, you know, like fake, like all the mustaches are fake. And yeah. they are all men of a certain age. Yeah. Yes. They yeah. may all be long distance truck drivers as well. And the girls that are going on and off the stage are all dressed like the various different numbers from showgirls. But I was a bit surprised. We get some nudity in this movie. Not as much as I expected. No. For being a movie about, ostensibly, a strip club. Yeah. It is very bare with the breasts. 
Wait. It's almost tasteful. Like they didn't yeah. want to offend anybody. Well, I wonder. I wonder if there's um because I know there's like like when you actually see a stripper stripper like she's got pasties on. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if there was like some weird loophole like they you know like had to you know they're like oh we're the tasteful strip club you know. Maybe they couldn't get a permit because they were shooting in Los Angeles and there was like a nudity clause. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know. I've never been to LA. But yeah, the final other thing that you should know is that these girls are introed and outroed by Vic, who is the announcer slash maybe owner, and he's played by Sandy Barron. But he gives them phrases like uh, he'll introduce a girl and call her the builder of major erections. <laughs> <laughs> She's not much upstairs, but what a stack. Oh my God. He's like, it's very sticky. It's very like what I think of as like, you know, um, you know, kind of like the sense of humor that was like around in like Dirty Dancing. You know, it's 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 like that kind of like a. Hey. It's almost dad jokes. It's it's this is like grand. This is like great granddad jokes. You know. <laughs> But also, please tip your waitress and maybe get hard and also feed <laughs> feed the vampires. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, like he, tr- he introduces like candy at one point. He's like, no, come to the stage. You know, she's she's delicious. She melts in your hand. She's candy. I was like, yeah. Ugh, candy. <laughs> Ugh, girl, get a better name. OK, the, before we before we like move on, I would say that there is some like really great budget filmmaking going on here when you first get to the bar, mm-hmm. because it is clearly a shitty, shitty location that they made kind of a cool looking trapezoid bar. Like when you first walk in, it has this like weird MC Escher kind of thing going that is you're, you're like, OK, either a it was them not having a budget, so they had to make what looked to be a stage and patrons and a bar in a space that was clearly not meant for it. Correct. Yes. Or it's this weird kind of like welcome to the labyrinth, you know, uh, the labyrinth of fuchsia and green. You're well, never going I was going to say, I wonder if that's why they made the lighting choices they did to make yeah. it look a lot more extravagant or garish, <laughs> than, garish than the set <laughs> than it actually was. I mean, I think garish, but also stylish. Like, if it can cover up some of the flaws and maybe make it look more interesting so you're distracted by the neon as opposed to the overall emptiness of the space, you yeah. may be willing to cut it a bit more slack. I, yeah. Which, you know, like, when you think about what this bar is, what this strip club is, I mean, it's... And also, there's a there's a shot later on um, in which this bar is literally next to... The methadone clinic. Like, it is literally next to the free clinic. Well, because as we learn, yeah, they only go for vagrants and transients. Like, they only go for the people that would go to the methadone clinic. Which, again, is this, it's this kind of idea of, like, this is a bar that is trying to fail, but has been failing for 50 years. Mm -hmm, You know, its goal is to run under the radar and always be not a place you want to linger. Right. Yeah, exactly. Or get eaten. <laughs> if you linger too long, you may just be eaten. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get to the main event, gents. So, oh. after an unenthusiastic dance number, we are then introduced to Katrina, played by Grace Jones. She arrives on stage for some kind of avant garde performance wearing a red wig, kabuki makeup, and she has a headless mannequin as a chair prop. This wig, like, what this everything this is it a everything clown is wig? My everything <laughs> I, I i literally wrote kabuki makeup plus clown wig okay so there's a lot to unpack here right <laughs> we're gonna be here all night we're long. gonna be here a minute so um so first off one what i find interesting uh before i even get to grace jones right is the fact that this this headless mannequin it's not just a mannequin it's a like a proper ch- chair like it's mm-hmm. big yeah but and of this like white male figure yeah. right with black line markings. like markings which i would like to point out and i have like and on this this because i knew we we're going to be talking about this i like looked up the actual name that's an original keith herring like, okay. do you know who the artist Keith Haring is? No, um, no, you so youngins... educate everyone. <laughs> okay, so Keith Haring is he was an he was a gay artist who was alive during the eighties, along with like Basquiat. He was in the sort of Andy Warhol, you know, like factory scene. Okay, like if you've seen um, 
like Google him right now and you will go, oh my gosh, I totally have a t-shirt of his or I like saw a, a sweatshirt of his at like Urban Outfitters because it's like he's a seminal artist, like an American artist. But again, and also he was fucking hot. He was like, <laughs> like he was daddy nerd hot. Like before that, those terms had even like run up against each other. Okay, um, question: Do you yeah. know would he have been well known at the time of this film, like when it he, was released? He would have been known in New York art circles. Mm, okay, you know, like, um, you know, if you were, you know, like in in that scene in that Studio Fifty Four scene, yes, absolutely. Like, there's murals of his like all over the world. But you, if you lived in Iowa, probably not, you know, <laughs> yeah, okay. in 1986, of, you know, of course not. And here's the reason why is because him and this whole generation of gay men, we all lost to AIDS. Yeah, of course. You know, like that was the thing is that he was one of the, him, Basquiat, like there's many, many more that were these kind of like up and coming promising faggots that were going to like take over the world that like they never got a chance to move from underground to res- above ground respectable you know yeah. and and that was the first thing i thought and it's so funny that now like that chair w- would be at moma like it would be mm-hmm. it would be like millions of dollars if it's not already or if it's not in grace jones's like, i was insane unless somewhere. grace jones took it <laughs> right. like it's on like her island house somewhere you know <laughs> um also her body paint it's the same thing and yes. that was one of the big discoveries for me i was just like how is how is this not like a homosexual like how is this not being shown at gay pride festivals mm-hmm. you know it's a bizarre little sequence like it's I- oh <laughs> oh, shall we shall we move on to the hair and makeup? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, let's talk about the red wig. Yeah, the red wig is crazy. It's like the shape of a football. Yes. Yeah. Kind of. Somewhere between a triangle and a football. I just think everything about this seems genetically engineered to be as striking and captivating as possible. Like, right. my notes say, you know, after this, everyone is briefly stunned. And I yes. feel like... I was there as well. Like she is so yeah. mesmerizing. And I yeah. know part of it is Grace Jones. Like she is such a captivating woman, but there's something about the fact that this is also a sequence that plays out almost entirely in full. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah. what a two and a half minute sequence. It's a five minute sequence. And you hadn't or, even mentioned you know, something like that. The, 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 the metal spiral bikini that she's wearing. Well, okay. So, so there's a lot going on, right? So she's, so when you first see her, she has strikingly blue eyes, mm-hmm. right? Yes. And this is a time I want to circle back to this because this is a time when in order to have contact lenses, they actually were made of glass. Yeah. Ooh. Like this is like, they this is heavy, not clear view. Uncomfortable. Or like very thick plastic that they would paint on and put them in. So one, she cannot see. Or if she can, she has extremely limited vision. But also, she is a black woman with with blue eyes. Mm -hmm. Also, she is in white face. And it's, is it kabuki? Is it, you know, but it's like you have to look very closely at her. Also, her hands are covered with these like cat claws. So she is like, she's like frightening like red fright wig mm-hmm. blonde or excuse me red fright wig white face blue eyes and like and slowly she peels all of that off over the course of this performance to have this like tribal queer mm-hmm. paint on underneath her meanwhile she, of course she does she, like the song she's lips or she's like performing to has no lyrics it's like something you would hear out of like cbgb's you know like <laughs> just like hey like we invented this thing called a computer let's see if it makes music let's see if it makes <laughs> new thing sounds. called synth that we're experimenting yeah. with <laughs> like it's like this is like the underground scene at the time right so this is and also it's a quote unquote it is a strip it's a strip it is yeah you know like it's a strip tease but she's playing this like like she takes like this the lights come up and she like looks like she doesn't know where she is for a while and then she just decides to be like a panther for a while mm-hmm. and then she just like gets confused and falls asleep in this giant <laughs> white man lap that's like has no head you know, and like goes back to sleep on her throne until she until something more interesting than you comes along. Well, and the irony is that they, I mean, I don't buy for a second that any of the men in the strip club would legitimately enjoy this because I feel like they would be like, "Give me the tits." But I disagree. I disagree, <laughs> sir. 
Really? I do. I really? do. As as a downtown performance artist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but they are not. I do have to say. <laughs> I are... do have to say. It, sometimes you, if like, would they have like would like? I think the reaction that the director had them do is kind of appropriate. Where they're just like, "What the fuck was that?" But also. Up, like genuine applause and be like oh cool okay mm-hmm. that yeah was that was that was actually really good and then they immediately forget it so i don't think like i don't think they'd be hostile to it in a way but i do think that they would it, it's like yeah they're like get get back to the real show i i got the impression that she was hypnotizing them with her dancing a little bit Ooh, yeah i thought that too that, and so they, I, very it, salome and, well that that's yes. what i thought the joke was where it was like look these are guys going to see boobs and they don't really get that and right. yeah and what they get instead is a performance art show but do which, they <laughs> well, well that's the thing so i think i i again got the impression that they were all hypnotized by her crazy mm. vampire powers it, it reminded me a lot did you did you watch the the, the tv show of american gods like yes. the the tv yes. version of that oh, like it reminded us. me of that what uh, was it baphomet or you know no, whatever uh, that character or i can't the remember. vagina eater the, 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 yeah. The, yeah. yeah 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 the, like the, the horror of babylon or you know whatever <laughs> mm-hmm. whatever name we have given her you know it is that like this is like old sexuality you know right. this is like like she is literally doing the dance of the seven veils, which she has been doing since the you know question mark, which in mm-hmm. the grand scheme of things, like Bilquis kind of step, Sorry. Like, Bilquis, thank you, there thank you. Go. Here's the thing, I this movie is so ripe for reexamination because there's a lot there that's good, and there's a lot there that they fucked up, and there's a lot there that is like kind of questionable and you know in a 2020 lens yeah but here's the thing i don't think it's a movie i think it's a graphic novel i want to see the graphic novel of vamp and the continuing adventures of this world because i want to know more about katrina uh okay okay yeah i know yeah think on that for a second well no because i'm thinking okay so you want like a sequel series where it's like we're following you know keith and allison with you know as he runs vampire bar of the damned with aj living in the sewers yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. or no like ostensibly i know we're jumping to the end but like he takes over the bar the dude like and if and aj takes over the bar you mean I mean, why not? It would be easy. Yeah. For, you know, it's just like he's dead. Uh, killed he most has the, vampires. the personality. Yeah. They've killed all the old vampires. Like, why? And here's this guy who, from the beginning, is that precocious asshole, sexy asshole character that we all know and love. Like, why wouldn't he run a vampire bar, you know, in the middle of downtown New York circa 1987? But I, but I don't think, like, in movie form, it's kind of like womp womp. But in like a longer format, I think it'd actually be pretty good. I would buy that because then you can actually space apart your seven movies into seven right? issues. <laughs> and also have backstory, mm-hmm. you know, as opposed to, well, Grace Jones, she has a, you know, toot and common mask in her dressing room. So I guess she's Egyptian? Question? <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to lie. The other thing that kind of came to me. So I, I think there's huge racial implications in this particular scene, um, as well as and, the fact the that dance. it's a it's a black woman who is ostensibly the the villain of this film but like i'm less interested in the fact that she's a villain than the fact that she controls everybody in the way she does that and but, in kabuki makeup with a, an assistant who's an asian woman i mean assistant i use that lightly yeah. uh, whatever she is her, her she's just like, another stripper as well she's, no yeah. we never see her strip well she, but she's also in charge of bringing people oh no she's food. she's the uh, she's a, she's a she's a shot girl she's a waitress yeah. Yes. But I guess so are all the girls in charge of finding potential food for Katrina or is it mm, just her mm, or like mm. I, we don't really get the dynamic of what the the hierarchy of this strip club is besides Katrina's the boss. I know Katrina she, and also she must go through staff like all the time. Frequently. I mean she's yeah. punching people's hearts out like it's going out of style. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got the impression that Vic is her Renfield, which is why yes. we see him eating mm-hmm. cockroaches. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, he's a junkie. Well, which then we get into this, like, when we get to that stuff, this, like, this, like, vampire equals junkie, you mm-hmm. know, like, in a time of, like, literally, like, crack is whack America, you know? Yeah, right. The epidemic is en route. Yeah. I mean, I feel like from the genesis of this scene, you can understand why they built so much marketing around mm-hmm. her. It's also interesting that we're having this conversation and talking about how she's such a a figure or like a fixture of this film, but she's not really as well used as she could be. And then 
they literally replicate the exact same problem when they re- when they make Queen of the Dam with Aaliyah. Yeah. yeah it's exactly. like almost the exact same. She's got like the same kind of jewelry accoutrement, the same kind of regal fixture. She's hypnotizing people. She's dancing. And she is so underutilized in that movie. It's criminal. Well, it's same with, I mean, I'm going to go back to From Dustle Dawn because it's an easy one, but it's the same with Salma Hayek as Santanico Pandemonium. She gets her one dance with that snake and then she yeah. transforms and then she's dead. I aggressively dislike that movie because I'm not interested in the film. I mean, there's a lot of fun stuff in that second half of the film. But as soon as they get rid of Selma Hayek, like even before Selma Hayek was a big deal and I saw that movie, I was like, why did you just kill the most interesting character in this movie? And this is the, so this is one of my theories is that like, th- so think of the, these like schlock, schlocky, cheesy, quote unquote, horror movies like they want to front load their movie with all the good stuff because they know by out like by the 45 minute mark you're probably already invested you'll stick around or or the, the like the demographic at the time was a bunch of like they're like they're drinking they're smoking weed they're making out they're fucking they're mm-hmm. like this is what's going on in the remember this is all right for you youngsters back in the day we didn't have the netflix and chillin like we <laughs> we would go to the movie theater and jerk each other off in public <laughs> like that was kind of the attitude of the time it's just like let's put all the stuff up front yeah when people are still paying attention which is why it's really weird like as a 2020 audience member you're just like wait i signed on for F- revenge of the nerds and i am less than 25 minutes into this film and i'm getting studio like legit what it would have actually looked like at studio 54 mm-hmm. You know, in which everyone is like pansexual, queer, on drugs, like have, like Liza's been up for days and like Andy Warhol is like shooting everything. And it's, you know, there's like hot shirtless dudes like running around like bartending. Like that is what I imagine. That is what New York is. In the was. 80s, what actually was, yeah. and they were trying to, like, capitalize on that, but it didn't translate to Reagan's America, right. is, is my theory. And that's why, like, all that fucking prosthetics and, like, makeup and all that sort of stuff, also probably because I bet you Grace Jones, she was like, I will do this twice. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> I will do eight hours of makeup. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I will only put on these blue contact lenses twice. And that you just better get what you better get because I have to go shoot, you know, like I have to go be a Bond girl or, you know, go right. do like a photo shoot. Yeah. You know. Sorry, I was okay. trying to see. Yeah, because if you do a kill. Oh, it was 85, actually. It was the year before this. Oh, wow. Oh, shit. So she, I mean, so she was like literally top of her game. Yeah. This yeah. is like peak. This would have been a huge here. get for this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and I also imagine like imagine going to a bar where that was the performance. Like oh literally, God. like literally Grace Jones in something very similar to that, you know, like you kind of got the impression the filmmakers, you know, just were like, hey, I hear this crazy New York is, uh, you know, it's like oh, it's a wonderland down there, you know, and they like just kind of put the perform. They're like, and then Katrina performs, you know, <laughs> in the script and they're just like, we're just giving Grace Jones free reign over all of that. And that was what you got. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like in a lot of ways, I think like those, like that, that dance sequence is like the starting point of what could be a really good film, like a really good story. Yeah. Yeah. So what we get instead, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, but it does it does kind of lead us into the next stage of this film. So really, this is the first act. And now that yeah. Katrina has been introduced, this is where the film starts to really kind of take off. So Keith watches dejectedly as AJ decides he's going to try to go after Katrina because he remember, we're still here to get a stripper for this fraternity party that we will literally never address again. <laughs> Who better than the performance artist to to do that? Which I'm just like, dude. Come on now. Like, literally, <laughs> this is the one you choose? Even the idea that you could go into New York and just get a stripper and bring her back to campus for a party for that night? Oh, I oh, know. But that, well, that's what New York was for. Like, you have to understand. <laughs> no, no, really. Like, I mean, like, in all seriousness, like, before, um, you know, before essentially, well, like, essentially Disney came in with the Lion King and they're like, 
this place is a dump. We want we to need like to clean up Times Square. <laughs> yeah, like they made a deal with the city of New York, and it was like, listen, we are going to invest millions and billions and billions of dollars into the the family friendly New York Times Square. Oh my god, that it is today. Mm-hmm. Like New York back in the day, like it's called it was called Hell's Kitchen for a reason. Yeah, you know, like it was where you went. It, it's like for like sex and drugs. Yeah, yeah, sex and drugs. Yeah. You know, and and illegal guns and, you know, like it's it's like that whole thing was actually weirdly common, I guess. Yeah. But I'm also like I'm questioning more. I'm just like I'm questioning the again, the the white privilege of, you know, AJ's character of just being like, I want the prettiest. I want the most exotic thing I can find, <laughs> you know, like that's the gonna like not not candy no. like like. No. In all honesty, they, they if they had gotten candy, they would have gone home and she would have made a lot of money. They would have, you know, like been successful frat boys and there would have been no movie. But instead, no, yeah. you pick the performance artist. Yeah, yep. because they thought that they could get her. Yeah, because yeah, she sucks. hypnotized them. <laughs> that I, too. Oh, man. All right. So he ends up going back with her and she removes uh, his shoes. He removes his top. He lies down. She climbs on top of him. Very sexy she, scene. There's a lot of this is licking really sexy. going on here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then she bites his neck. And it's quite it's quite a bit more gruesome than I was expecting. Well, it really focuses on the tongue, like, working the neck wound. And I appreciated that. And again, like, like we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, the makeup on her, like, the toes, the, the fingers, the, the fucking face, it mm. is some good. really stellar effects work. Yeah. 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 And I love, and I love that it's 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 like you said, it's like gruesome. Mm-hmm. It's, oh yeah, it's you know, not pretty. She's not, she's not a sexy vampire. No, she is. She's she's actually you know kind of going to like this sort of Buffy terminology. She's like more like of a demon, you know, like mm-hmm. or of a you know um like it yeah like it looked like when like almost not like not werewolf but like there's something animalistic about it. Yeah, you know, which is maybe. <laughs> The other interesting thing here is that AJ dies. So he he is <laughs> actually dead. Nope. AJ dies. Well, we we see people get bit all the time and then 5 minutes later they're up walking around and they're fully formed vampires mm. and they're totally good to go and here AJ is dead for like the next 20 minutes. Yeah. Like so dead, so dead that the the cops get called in. It does make for some good surprises though when he pops back up twice. <laughs> oh yeah yeah this movie loves to bring people back yeah ever yeah it's american horror story coven oh my yeah it God, definitely oh, falls off. into that like they're all vampires they're all vampire all of them if there's a character they're a vampire you guys yep. just like yeah like we get it unless it's keith and later allison they're vampires yeah. <laughs> so in the bathroom keith observes that vlad who is either the bouncer or just the heavy of the bar he's i wrote this down as queer Logan. content two men in a stall <laughs> yeah. and he is strangely topless <laughs> so he comes out and keith observes that he has strange marks on his back is it just that we're meant to assume he was getting some uh i can't remember it's like he's a masochist right yeah, because I wasn't sure if that was like, oh, it's a clue that he's also a vampire. And I was like, mm, is it? I don't. I don't <laughs> no, think I think it's, it's like, deep. like it's like we're you know we quote unquote we as audience members to be like, oh, freaky, sexy thing, you know, <laughs> just being like, I don't know what would leave a mark like that, but that is not the America that I want to be, you know, like, and we're just supposed to like recoil and go, oh, we don't. What is it? But in actuality, he's probably just a masochist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we all know what he was doing. Yeah. So Vic is eating cockroaches, and it seems as though AJ has disappeared. So at this point, Keith hooks up with Emma Reto, as <laughs> she is going by, and she has this running gig where she always recognizes him. He doesn't recognize her. She also has a very adorable costume malfunction that makes her instantly endearable. It's so cute. It's so cute. <laughs> her, her little shoulder strap keeps slipping off and he keeps picking it up. Really good work on that costume too. That's how you know they're destined for each other. <laughs> so they head outside and Keith observes Vlad carting a large garbage bin with a body sized bag in it and he pays someone off 
but it's uh, too late for that because Amaretto is already there and they're going ahead to the apartment building because she thinks that AJ has gone with Candy because that's what Cimarron, who is played by Lisa Leon, has said. Also, Duncan is somewhere at this point. He's wasted in Pervert's Row. Exactly. Like, we, we've just kind of been like, oh, there's another character. Didn't we? Did we? Did we have a friend? Duncan no? is okay, cool. out of the movie by this point, minus his death scene. Like, that's it. Yeah, pretty much. More or less, yeah. Which, again, is... I mean, at this point, I thought it was funny because I thought that we might just keep checking in on him and he would just get increasingly more drunk right. and unaware of the danger. And then I was actually really disappointed later when they don't do more with right. him. I, yeah. I actually think it would have been funnier had he literally just been drunk at that bar the entire movie and then like the end of the movie is him walking out like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> no? No? Okay. He, he is fine. the final girl. He's the final girl. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't disagree with you. I think part of it is that you're you're playing what we would normally see and this film is like oh you thought he was gonna live now he already did mm. yeah yeah yeah. Mm, yeah maybe i don't know i, I wouldn't remember they're that trying I to subvert what you think is gonna happen i'm going no, with no, no. shitty writing shitty budget and like um pretty <laughs> poor directing <laughs> I, is what I, I'm going with. I would not say that i walked in into this thinking he was gonna be the survivor <laughs> of the group i mean i didn't even think they were gonna bring him along so that's it was true. surprising that's enough <laughs> So at this point, Katrina rips out Summerin's heart, and uh, then we go back to this super dingy-looking hotel where apparently all of the After Dark Club dancers are living. And I don't know, man. This place... okay? Now this is now this is where this is where I get into this whole like okay, what what movie are we in now? Okay, yes, this is a completely different film, again. totally different movie. It's very Dick Tracy like. Because one, we're also now the the, the weird ass color palette has like spilled out into reality, quote unquote. You know, it's we're no longer in a strip club. Now we're like walking down the street and it's still neon fuchsia and green yep. as far as the eye can see. And like everything, everyone's old. They're all like they look like Dick Tracy characters. It's it's like being in a comic book. Well, and then we get to this building and we have this extended sequence where he's almost final destination by the elevator. Yeah. After they have this really meet cute moment laughing about the bellhop's hair in which i would also like to point out like they have a bellhop in an elevator that only has buttons mm -hmm. and i was like okay what <laughs> and also this man's wig listen in the great <laughs> the great great museum of terrible toupees this man's fucking wig is <laughs> It really deserves its own wing because this toupee is the worst. Like this man is 80 years old and it, he has like, like uh, it looks like a dead cat Elvis wig on his head. Um, and they're like, oh, oh, he's so cute. But he's also the bellhop in an elevator that doesn't have the actual, like literally you just have to press a button. And I was like, why is he in here? Oh, that's right. He's a vampire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because <laughs> everybody's a vampire. Because everyone's a vampire, <laughs> except for Snow and his gang. Right. Yes, they're just they're just terrible, terrible gang members <laughs> slash Andy Warhol junkies. Exactly. Yeah. So after Keith almost gets crushed in this elevator shaft, which again, what movie are we watching right now? Well, they needed some action to like wake up the teenagers. I guess so, because that is literally the end of this entire apartment hotel scene, right? Like he just leaves and then Amaroto comes out and they bicker because she thought he was going to wait for her and he was like I almost died I'm flustered because you live in a death apartment you live in a death apartment and he just he's like okay whatever and she walks away and at this point that's when Snow and his cronies show back up and they chase him down the street into a neon lit construction site and he eventually gets trapped in these sewers where he observes... I couldn't tell. Was it Snow who ends up getting attacked by the little girl that they saw on the doorstep? Or is it just somebody else? It's somebody else because I'm pretty sure she eats the fuck out of him in the funniest. <laughs> oh my god, yes. This little girl... I mean, flies at him. I mean, Joe, this is the Zombiever on a string from Zombievers. Yes. There is some wire foo going on here. <laughs> Launches at this man... It is so funny. And then not only and then not only like once she makes contact, this like terrible actor literally just sort of like half ass staggers his way around with what is clearly 
a doll yeah. like clamped on his arm. Like I, I, in my notes, I was just like, I was like, best Halloween costume 2020. <laughs> Seriously, like a z- zombie vampire girl attached to your arm all night. Please, that's a great Halloween costume. But it's like this man is not selling it at all. He's literally just going like, ah. Well, I think they told him you do, you're not going to be in frame for most of it. So you only need to be able to sell one facial expression and then just give like a kick or an arm flail here and there and the rest of the time we'll just you know fill it with adr noises but but instead in the editing room they're like no we're gonna ha- we're gonna spend like a solid 12 seconds of watching this guy just being like ah <laughs> like like the paul rubens death in like buffy, buffy the vampire slayer yeah <laughs> Which actually, I think there's like a lot of similarities in like, like Paul Rubens, you know, like the whole thing of like Paul Rubens was like the only one who got the campiness of that film, you know, like with his death sequence and like, you know, how like the lines and, and I think there is this like, this was the unintentional version of that. It's like, this was the kind of shit that, you know, like you're making fun of. This is like people who are terrible actors, but they're, it's troll two territory, (laughs) you know, like they're so bad that it actually transcends that and becomes divine. Yes. But also, how dare you? Because Hilary Swank is magnificent in Buffy. She is. She is. <laughs> but she's not playing that, like... No. She's not playing camp. No. You know? Like, that sort of, like, wink and a nod, you know that I know that you know. You know? <laughs> you know? Oh, I know. Yes. You know. You know what I know. That you know that I know. So Keith eventually comes topside because remember he's been in the sewer this whole time. It's a very low, low sewer. <laughs> the 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 pink and the the the, the purple and green sewer. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I kept like like my one of my friends like we watched this the other day. He was like, I literally am expecting the Riddler to jump out and just be oh, like riddle me this. No, <laughs> you it, know? it is very Batman Forever because you've got the greens yeah. for the Riddler and the magenta for Two Face. Yeah. yeah, it's it, like it is. It is like comic book territory. Did Joel Schumacher do the lighting on this movie? <laughs> He's actually David Wank. Is it <laughs> or Wank or Wank? Did I say Wank? <laughs> it's Richard Wank, but he's Richard Wank's boyfriend. His oh, new got boyfriend. It. Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm making that up. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so Keith comes topside, and he ends up hiding in a dumpster because he almost gets run over by a dump truck. And this is when he discovers both AJ and Simran's bodies. Wah, wah. Boom, boom, boom. So th- this, to me, minus this little girl Wirefu, is kind of like where I'm like, okay, movie, let, let's let's pick it up a little bit. Yeah, like we literally just watched some dude wander around an apartment for no, no reason. reason. Yeah, at all. exactly. Did we have another set piece there, and then we had to cut it for budgetary reasons? I don't know, but but basically, then we get back to Katrina because now now we're going to back to more politics with Katrina and Vic, where right. they're like, oh. I do love this, though. So she does this weird thing with a razor blade where she, like, rubs it over her face. And then she, you know, cuts herself and lets Vic drink her. But she gives this look. Like, she is so annoyed by Vic as he drinks her blood. (laughs) Well, he almost begs her for power, right? He's like, can I just have a little bit? And she's, you can tell, she's been doing this for 75 years and she is fucking done with it. It's almost as if she were, like, a dealer or <laughs> like um a supplier of some kind and 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 these gentlemen these people that think that they have the power over her they actually are her like i don't know they're it's almost like they're addicted hmm. 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 i don't understand the analogy what <laughs> all right let's see if i can explain it better <laughs> But no, like this is one of those moments where I was just like, "Fuck!" This has like, like a super kind of interesting, complicated, dark analogy of like the sort of classic vampire is, you know, is like drug user, mm-hmm. you know, trope, and also, you know, and she's just like, "Oh, this fucking this asshole," you know, and the guy who on the outside is the respectable face of this establishment, and you know, it like tears her up that she has, she needs these puny. Yeah, mortals to survive, you know, to like do her, you know, like run her dry cleaning, you know, and like do her taxes and shit. But it's a very different kind of relationship than, again, not to belabor the point, but like then we see the Chris Sarandon character in Fright Night, right? Mm, Where he's charismatic, he gets off on ordering people here. 
there's a certain amount of necessity. It almost reminded me a little bit of Let the Right One In, where you don't yeah. have full yeah. control over everything, so you have to keep these fucking annoying human beings or like human lackeys around yeah. to serve you. Yeah, I mean, somebody's got to. Some, listen, if you're if you are the oldest living vampire empress on Earth, you're not burying bodies, you know. Like that's not a thing you do, you know. So you kind of make you just delegate. <laughs> oh my god, sequel idea! It's her and Delphine Singer from Daughters of Darkness, just like running oh around god. looking fabulous, yes. Yes. ordering yes. people to do their bidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I'm I, I'm still convinced. I don't think Katrina's. I don't think Katrina dies at the end of this movie. And I'm I'm setting it up as a sequel in my head where it's AJ and Katrina are like running this thing and like getting like making it work. I like it. I like it. But first, we have to come back to Keith, everybody's favorite yeah. in this movie, uh, yeah. Keith. So he calls the cops and then he returns to the bar because he's going to wait for them to show up. And at this point, the film remembers that Duncan is still a character. He's mm-hmm. there, but drunk. But does nothing. But does nothing. <laughs> and uh, then AJ shows up, and he looks a little less than fresh. His shirt so this, is not as pressed as he'd like. <laughs> this dialogue was filled for me with double entendres, or at least, like, coded, like, queer coding in this. When Well, can we just accept the fact that AJ is super gay for Keith? 100%. The, like, basically, like he goes, I love you, Keith, and all I can see right now is food. And I'm like, yeah, that ass. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I should have tapped that when we were in our skivvies earlier. Oh, and he now. wants to rim that hole like it's going out of style. It's, like, ready. Uh, so the police arrive, but, of course, they find that AJ is still there, so there's no case to be made. They leave, and at this point, Keith is then attacked by the vampire stripper who looks like she's from the dominatrix section of the Showgirls movie. Yeah, that was pretty weak. I was like, really, you guys? Like, I know, I know Grace Jones has to be the star, but, like, you could have done something. Yeah. Yeah. With with other with other vampire chick or build somebody else up like none of these women are characters. If we no. didn't no. have no. Grace Jones, this film would be lacking for any kind of threatening females. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially this one because she is literally dispatched with a high heeled shoe. It's like Steven Weber in single white female, and which this admittedly bitch. is pretty fucking gay. I did I did like it. I I thought it was ridiculous, but I liked it. Yeah, yeah. Like that's I mean, in in all the ways to go, being stabbed by a heel is mm-hmm. um is is pretty fucking gay. However, mine um, like the thing that irked me was the choice of heel. Like <laughs> that was like a sensible flat, you know, practically. <laughs> go for the high high heel. I was like you're in a strip club. What? What? That's like a character shoe at best, <laughs> you know. I was like, what? There's no, there's no, what? Like, none? No, there's no stilettos around at all. Oh, God. Straight person probably did the props for this. <laughs> so at this point, obviously, AJ reveals that he is a vampire. And they have this protracted back and forth discussion that I think goes on for far too long it before does. Keith is ultimately forced to stake his bestie. Oh my God. This scene is so gay. This scene is like, it's literally, he's just like, do me, man. Do me. Just, and I was just like, yeah, just breathe. Just breathe through it, man. Just breathe just through it. It'll be it. fine. Yeah. Just, just like, just penetrate your friend. It's very It'll be fine. hilarious to me that Rustler does this and Nightmare on Elm Street 2 right. within, so fucking within gay, a year right? of each other. Yeah. Like, and, and is this, and you know, if you've, listen, if, you know, before we get to the plug, the plug <laughs> section, um, if you watch, you know, Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street, mm-hmm. like, is it just in the water at the time that there are these like yeah. straight men in Hollywood that are like running the game that are like, yeah, we didn't know we were shooting in a gay bar. Man. What? I didn't like whoever wrote this script. If they try to pull that shit of like, yeah, we didn't know there was gay subtext. Fuck you, buddy. I, fuck you. I don't know. I think there's more plausible deniability in this film than right. Nightmare 2, but it's still, like, oh, all you have to do brave. is say, hey, do you think there's a little more going on between these two? And it's immediately evident. It's so visible. Yeah. I mean, well, and, and the, but the actors aren't playing it. Like, actually, this is the kind of, like, Julius Caesar, like, no, I will die a noble death. I can't do it myself. You're yeah. my best friend. Yeah. It's that, like, band of brothers. Yeah. You know, I would like, die for oh, you, man. But also, tr- yeah, like a true train. friend would do this. But in, but of course, you know, like we are watching this, going, yeah, just make sure you lube it up before you stick that thing in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
because you got to lick it before you stick it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so AJ's dead. Ah, at this uh, point, Keith realizes quote, quote. again, <laughs> <laughs> again, part two. <laughs> Wait for part three. So Keith is stopped by Vic before he can leave because at this point he and Amaretto are going to try to make an exit, but uh, it's closing time and it seems like oh shit. Everybody is surrounding them. They are in trouble. And and she she seems in on like she's she's still playing the like naive like what I was working with vampires. Oh my god! She like, I, get out I was so thing. confused by it. I did not understand like how did she not know? <laughs> right. But also, but also, like she, the actress herself, kind of carries it off. Where you're like, does she not know, or is she yeah. like, or is she like s- playing the sort of naive thing so well, mm-hmm. you know, for this like Princeton frat boy? Yeah, the best part about the way that Pfeiffer plays this character is that you legitimately don't know. You could see it working that she is an undercover vamp and she's actually going to kill him later, yeah. or. No, she's just naive and bubbly, and she was probably like, I needed a waitressing job. <laughs> yeah, she's just from New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. So um, my favorite part of this film is when Keith is stopped by Vic, and he go, he just turns to everybody, and he says, "This, there's vampires in this bar. We all have to get out of here. And you just hear someone off screen go, they're not bad people. I no, wrote no, no. that down. Okay. No, wait, no, wait, 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 no. <laughs> So, so somebody's like, yeah, like there's a vampire. She said, that doesn't mean they're bad people. Yeah. Which to me, that would, that's what I was like, okay, this is, this is the definition of if you were just like half watching this film, you wouldn't catch that. Right. Right. And it's like nobody on screen says it. It's literally just somebody like, you know, like in a loop group, you know, like just like throws this line in. Yeah. But it's that mentality of you're going to like meet people in the city that are like, experimental performance artists and like Mm -hmm. junkies and like pimps and hustlers and strippers. But that doesn't mean they're bad people. Mm -hmm. And that to me is like the secret heart of this movie. And it's kind of why I love it a little bit. Well, I mean these, it's really these guys wandered into the wrong place, but at the same time, the only reason that (laughs) the only reason these people are presented as bad is because our heroes are in danger of being killed by them. And even then, like, are they? <laughs> you know? Like, if if you were if you were someone who you were spoken to by AJ's character, like in the beginning, where it's like, yeah, I really respect your talent. You know, you're you're really, you know, you're obviously you're good at what you do. And so you know, he's like obviously <laughs> like just expecting her to like fuck him right then and there. Yeah. For free, by the way. Which PS like, does not work, kids. Do not go to the strip club expecting to fuck the strippers. Uh, uh yeah. Like, and also just like, would you not eat him? Because I think I would. Mm. I'd be like, oh, kid. Oh, oh good kid. Privilege. oh. So the, again, it's like, it's, I, I love, I love this movie because it is kind of weird and complicated and not every layer works, but there's enough there that you're like, man, I can see what you're going for here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's also fucking funny. Oh, it's very funny. It, yeah. I, it's a charming movie. I mean, th- th- that's how I would just, I, this movie just charmed me. You know, you're right. Not, not all of it works. It's really clunky in some aspects. It drags in some aspects, but it has like, it's a, like, if it was a person, like I would want to hang out with this movie. As long as it looked like D.D. Pfeiffer. This is the friend that's going to be like an hour and a half late for brunch because they were like, you know, got arrested, you know, like went on a bender, but then also they're like your best friend, you know, you're just like, ah, at least they have a good story, you know. Mm. <laughs> okay, so the way out is apparently to light the bar on fire and then go yes. out the trap door to the service elevator that will deposit them in the alleyway. So they do that with Duncan. Some good physical comedy from Pfeiffer as she quote unquote like spills the the booze all over the ground because she trips over everything. Yeah. So the bar is burning and we see Vic and Vlad share one final drink together as they go Which up. Which takes swing. nine minutes. <laughs> like this is where the movie just like goes off the rails for me. Cause it's like their bars on fire. The fire is like across the room and not even that big. And these two guys are like, well I guess we're going to die. Oh, yeah. Um, it's the end of, fucking, it's the end of like, Titanic for these two. And you're just like, boys. Do, yeah. Like, do you not have a pitcher of water <laughs> anywhere? Anywhere. No? You're just going to roll over? You're oh, sitting okay. at a bar that hypothetically has water attached to it somewhere. Yeah. 
There's some real weird editing in this, but it takes so long. Yeah. Like, yeah. these, these like, Which, old actors and, and are just... It's a 93-minute oh, movie, too, so, like, it didn't have... I mean, you could have cut seven minutes from this movie. Yeah, this could be an 85, for yeah. sure, for yeah. sure. So, we get another really good... I, I would almost say that this next sequence exemplifies what the movie is all about. So the three of them get into the Cadillac and they are almost immediately boxed in between two cars of vampires. So there's oh one in God, a yes. big, oh, this, I think yeah. it's like a truck. And then I, there's one. I'm a sucker the for, the, the, for the shots. I, I'm a sucker for those shots when like the camera is like, you know, facing like the window and you just see the car coming. I'm really into those shots. I mean, back in, when this was made, it wasn't a fucking cliche. So no, it no, no, no. Even felt fresh. <laughs> but 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 like even even if it was that cliche is then subverted by the fucking parallel Parker. Yes. yes. <laughs> and that's what I love. It's so oh they, they get trapped between these two cars and they literally have to wait for this drunk man to get into his car and try to get out of a parallel park and drive away. And their their safety depends on it because they are going to be crushed between a truck and this garbage dumpster. Driven by by fake Andy Warhol. Yes. Yes. By and, snow. And they only manage to get out because this guy finally drunkenly drives away and it's a great mix of action and comedy mm -hmm. yeah well and then Definitely. of course now the car blows up yeah uh admittedly that was the t listen for you young kids out there um that was actually weirdly a time where cars just kind of did that wait sometimes. no 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 on the, film the, or in real life in real life <laughs> it's 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 the the ford pinto the car from cujo that car blew up all the time yeah, like unsafe at any speed like yeah. that was like you know the cutting corners in the auto industry and shit no i mean this is ridiculous, this movie. You know, it's like they kind of look at it sideways and it blows, blows up. up. Yeah. I do love um, Duncan, like, half out. He's on fire, half out the window, and he just goes, guys, <laughs> and then blows up. Yeah. See? Like, 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 like that guy, like, had had Duncan not like there's so many things I was like oh my gosh the camp the like funniness of this movie would have been so much better if it had not had like what is presumably a straight white dude at the at the directing table yep. at the writing table at the editing table you know like if they had actually let the like you said like these quote unquote side characters like be the main characters and let these like hapless frat boys just kind of be in with the mix mm -hmm. would have been fucking amazing meanwhile dick wank is listening to this going um excuse me i am a total mo <laughs> i just maybe. realized richard wank was probably called dick wank his entire life right oh. uh, maybe mm, uh, bullying what? for sure wow wow I will say, when this scene happens, it made me immediately wish that we had swapped Keith and Duncan, and how much more interesting this film... I mean, I don't... I wouldn't have wanted a drunk Duncan to be dragged along for the rest of this movie, but right. I would have thought it'd be interesting to see Amaretto slash Allison and Duncan try to survive kind of like, the rest like, of this Kind movie. of like funny, falling in love. Yeah, like how charming that would have been, you know? And it's it's not the fault of, um, of Chris Makepeace. I think he's Fine. No, he's great. He's fine. He's just he's he's poor man Sean Esten. Yeah, that was you know that's the only thing is that he's like fake Samwise Gamgee. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and his role doesn't. I mean, it's it, it's just not particularly compelling compared to every other character in this film, which is all of, all of whom are mostly larger than life. However, there was there was one moment where like I got to give him props, and it was like I was thinking that same thing. I was like, oh, this guy is like so milk toast. But like in the scene where he's like tr almost decapitated by the elevator, I was like, okay, he's for a quote unquote like average frat guy, I don't hate him. Like he is clearly yeah. taking charge of the situation. Mm -hmm. He's not being like, what do I do? You know, right. like he's actually playing it like a, a character with agency, yeah. which is one of my big uh, thing about horror movies is that when, you know, like I hate it when people make stupid decisions when, when they don't realize they're in a horror movie yet. Yeah. When clearly they are it's just like, listen, bitch, <laughs> fucking aliens are landing. The dead are rising. Now is the time to like, don't tell your kid it's going to be okay. Now is the time to teach them how to like brain something, you know? And yet we've spent what, like an hour and a half talking about how much we like Dee Dee Pfeiffer in this movie, where that is the entirety of Amaretto slash Allison's character is that yeah, she's constantly yeah. pausing the narrative so that she can be like, 
here's how we know each other. Never mind that we're <laughs> surrounded by vampires and in grave danger. <laughs> but you get the feeling that she can she can take care of herself, though. Like, you get the feeling that in a tight, you know, like whether she's a vampire or not, you know, she she's rolling with the punches in a way that, like, most female characters, especially, like, non-female, like, female non-protagonists would be like, what do I do, big strong boyfriend? And she's like... Yeah, she's there. She's in it. Yeah, she's present. She's like has agency. Yeah. I do think if this film was made even a couple years later, they probably would have let Allison be a little bit more... She would have been able to defend herself more than what she's actually given to do. But yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. What could have been? Yeah. So they decide they need some weapons, so they break into an ammunition shop, and Keith, of course, grabs Chekhov's bow and arrow, which we've already seen him use to great skill earlier in the film. Yep, nice callback. Yep. They uh, get surrounded by the little girl vamp and all of the Oh, this is the wire the foo. I'm sorry. I, like, messed that up. Yeah, this is when she flies at the guy. I mean, there's, like, two different instances where she does a big running <laughs> yeah, jump yeah, attack. Uh, this is also the moment where she, like, we realize, oh, other gang isn't a vampire gang. They're just a gang gang. Mm-hmm. That's like a warrior's gang. Yeah, because yeah, they say, what gang is this? Because they, <laughs> they don't know that they're vampires. See, I miss that line. We're the vegans. We're just really tired. We're lacking iron. <laughs> like, we just bruise easily. Sorry. I love you all, vegans. <laughs> Uh, so they make a hasty retreat down yet another alleyway, and they go into the sewers. Again. And, yeah. <laughs> Do you know why? Do you know why I figured this out? Oh, because uh, it's one set piece that you literally just have actors run back and forth. Yep. Like, it's literally the cheapest set well, on Earth. It's just, like, it's just like a spaceship. It's just metal hallways back and forth. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's... <laughs> with, with green and purple lighting. <laughs> this is the Jason X of New York. That's how they distinguished between the halls was they lit it differently with the same color lights, just in different sets. Oh, and right before we get in the sewers, this is when we learn that Amaretto is Allison Hicks. Mm-hmm. And she knows Keith because they played spin the bottle in fifth grade once. Yes. And she, she wants to make such a big deal out of that. And he's like, that is great. Get off this manhole cover because we are going to get eaten alive. Yeah, and he's also and he's also playing the like, is it is he's still playing the is she isn't she vampire game at this point. Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. this could be seen as a delay. No, tactic, the whole thing right? where he's just like, hey, hey, come look over here. Look, it's the sun. And she's like, uh huh. Yeah. And he's like, OK, cool. Just checking. Oh, I did not catch that. Good on you. Yeah. He's like, yeah. He's like, look up there. And she's like, uh huh. It's like, oh, cool, cool, cool. You're my girlfriend now. <laughs> you're, not, you're not the undead. Yeah. Okay, so they go into the sewers. They stumble into a crypt where they see several vampires are already starting to bed down for the day. So that's your cue that the sun is about to come out. They manage to set this area ablaze with a bunch of conveniently located barrels of flammable liquid, question mark. (laughs) It was New York in the 80s. (laughs) Everything was... Flammable and... Flammable and toxic. Yeah. But they blow the fuck out of these guys. It's... Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry. They burn the fuck out of these guys. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, we're heading into our finale because Allison gets immediately abducted by Katrina, who shows up in a different outfit. She is now bald, and she's got great earrings. Oh, she's in a different outfit every single time you see her. I don't know if we've mentioned that, but that is like... Every single time you see Katrina, she's in a completely different outfit, which makes you wonder, what are the other acts she does mm. in the strip club? Which is what I want to know. That's right. that's, yes. that's your sequel. That's it. It's like she's every every model. episode of this like episodic whatever, you get like a different Katrina Ooh. act. Yeah, no, 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 no. You make a TV show, and every episode yeah. is the name of her, like the name of the episode oh, is the name of her act, and then the, so the, the, pl- fucking good. the plot of the episode is built off of her act. Like it's themed after that. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. yeah. I'm into uh, it. Okay. I, I, I buy it. Print it, buy it, sell it. I like it. So Katrina has Allison. She'd be looking fine. Keith is obviously a little bit worried. We get a two minute showdown where Keith is going to shoot her and is trying to angle for the right position. And Katrina just kind of looks at him like, yeah, go for it, fucker. Take your best shot. So he does. He shoots her in the mouth with an arrow. And then Allison, this is Allison's big redeeming moment. She impales Katrina in the chest with a pipe, although neither of these things kill her. A little unconvincingly, but it's all right. It looks like she kind of taps it in, but it's maybe an inch into the actual chest. (laughs) 
It, it, there's some questionable physics there for a second. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine how much strength it might take to drive a giant pipe into someone's chest. I feel like it would take a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody tried at home. Let me know. Oh, my God. Also, this is, excuse me, this is like total sidebar. But like there's a fucking, like one of the funniest jokes is that like just is so campy is back when AJ, like they're trying to, wait, or is that coming up where they're trying to kill AJ? Yes, that's coming and, up. And, okay. All right. Mm, all right. Keep my mouth shut. <laughs> okay. So Allison wants to leave. She wants to run. And Keith refuses to. He's decided he's going to stay. He's going to face Katrina down. And ultimately he is luring her into a trap where he lifts ceiling panels slash grates out of the sewer to expose Katrina to sunlight again. Don't entirely understand how this works. It's it's a very Fright Night because it's the exact same thing that happens in that movie. It really is. Yeah. So uh, he ultimately gets her and no, no, wait, 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 wait. Okay. Hold up. When he ultimately gets her, she like bursts into flames yes. and she dies. She has like the ultimate like literally the ultimate fuck you death sequence. Well, it's a three stage process. So first we see green smoke, like CGI smoke kind of coming off of her in that eighties way where it looks yeah. like really badly computer generated because they just didn't know how to do it yet. And then all of her skin peels off. And this effect I quite liked. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, no. Cause it's like her corpse is facing the sky and it's like, there's a fan under her that's just blowing the skin off of her face. And it's very, it, it's like, it does that kind of like, was it Raiders of the Lost Ark? Like kind of yes, melty candle. Yes, yes, yes. Like you can tell it's shot in reverse and like upside down. Exactly. So like they just lit something on fire. Yeah. I think it's a lot of latex work. Yeah. Like it looks like it, like it looks pretty fucking gross. Like it's a, an effective shot. Mm -hmm. So then she's reduced to a skeleton. And at this point you think she's dead. And then the skeleton flips Keith and Allison the bird. And loved, then goes still. <laughs> loved, loved, loved this. Right? Like the definition of campiness mm -hmm. that like even in death, she's like, oh, fuck you. Yeah, that's your Paul Rubens from Buffy moment, right? You think yeah. she's so, dead yeah. and then it's yeah. a final fuck you. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's like funny and also like, you know, because you've got to imagine she's this Egyptian death goddess. That's also like, fuck you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I can't believe it was this guy, which is why it's such a flip kind of ending that I'm like, she can't be actually dead. No. She's probably like, fuck you. I've got to regenerate this. Oh, yeah. And it's going to take me months. Yeah. Fuck you, not like, I can't believe you killed me. It's yeah. real Lestat in Interview the Vampire, just uh, yeah, exactly. casually re rejuvenating over 200 years. I mean, you've got to think, if you are, what, a several hundred year old Egyptian vampire goddess, and then you get fucking put out to pasture by some goddamn Princeton oh, I know, right? entitled oh, I know. white boy. Yeah. Ugh, <laughs> no, that cannot be the way she goes. <laughs> so, yeah, we get one final thing where Keith thinks that Allison may secretly be a vampire, but she's not, so it's fine. And then Vlad shows up because he's not dead. And he's going to try to hurt her, but before he can do anything, he's actually killed by AJ, who is also Yay! not dead. <laughs> because, wait, know, right? Because, and this is the gayest thing ever, the chair wasn't made of wood, it was made of formica. It, yes. Yes. <laughs> I was like, that is an interior fucking design joke. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> Clearly, there is some homosexual sensibilities at the very least. Well, and he didn't he didn't get wood, and therefore he's got to he's got to come back to Keith. Oh my God! Did you just say it's, he didn't get wood? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and Mr. Wank is one of the screenwriters of this film. Um, which, by the way, he is he hasn't directed anything notable, like really, but like he's written. Such blockbuster action films as 16 Blocks. He co-wrote The Expendables 2 with Sylvester Stallone. Ooh, and he also wow. wrote The Equalizer 1 and 2 with Denzel Washington. I'm guessing he's not a homosexual, though. Probably I'm guessing he's not. not but like... the, he co-wrote this with Donald P. Borchers. And the only notable thing of his is the 2009 television remake of The Children of the Corn. Ugh. Potential homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I like, like kids like, and corn. Hey. Or it's just like or, or like camp. Like that like there there is like that that series to me is like there is like 
especially after the first one, is like it gets into that weird campy. You're just like, what oh, am I watching so here? <laughs> oh, my God. People, if you have not seen Children of the Corn 2, there is a kill with an old lady in a wheelchair that is so fucking good. So I've only oh, seen nice. the first one, but I have one of those DVDs where they have like all 10 of them on one disc. So oh, oh, wow. <laughs> I've always been curious. I have that with Puppet Master too, where it's like all of the Puppet wow. Masters on one disc. So Jesus. I think the quality of those films is going to be I, great. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I remember right. It's kind of it's like Poltergeist. It's one of those like the first one's great, the second one is boring, and the third one you're just like this has entered a whole new level of insanity. Mm-hmm. Probably. I've yeah. I've heard. Stay tuned. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't. I'm, I have to. I'd have to give it a rewatch yeah. to like actually like Me back too. that up. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I love that AJ's back, and then yeah, we kind of get like a happy send off where they just leave him. Yeah, this is to, weird. to pick up the pieces and start his underground vampire performance art bar. It's going to uh, be so fucking queer. It's going to be Grace Jones, and then AJ's going to be topless serving as bartender. Yeah. No. And they're like, literally, they're going to be doing coke and fucking and eating junky homeless people that come in from New Jersey. And it's like, that's the mo- that's the movie I want to see. He is going to <laughs> night school and it's fine. <laughs> yes, this is what he suggests is that he, he can just do night school and he'll be fine. And Keith does not give two shits. He just takes Allison and they walk away. Right. And like, a, like I, heterosexuals often do. Yeah, right. But I do love the final moments of this film where they walk into the street because they've just come up in the middle. I know what you're about to say because I was going to say it if you weren't. (laughs) It's just it's so amazing. Like visually, I was like, this is so simple and it's so effective because the whole film has been about how they are completely isolated. No one to help them. There's vampires everywhere. And then they emerge at Into the Dawn, the new day, and they just start walking down the street. There's no traffic at all. And then all of a sudden traffic just starts and it's like yeah okay normalcy wait, wait, wait. has resumed no way uh, and then and then in the sky a rainbow randomly <laughs> enough a motherfucking rainbow comes out no as if it's like lucky charms like it doesn't just appear yeah. like it, it starts from one end and like shoots like a shooting star across the sky <laughs> like a motherfucking portent like this is crazy <laughs> like it it is li- like this movie is so many weird levels of like, I don't think they knew, but somebody must have known that this is some this is some gay ass shit. Yeah, somebody was like, let me just work in a rainbow here. It's so crazy, campy, over the top. Like it's a, it would have made a better like like series, like graphic novel series or like I think it's the Buffy the Vampire Slayer syndrome. It's like when everybody is not playing the same thing. Mm. You know, it's like this person wants a serious horror movie, this person is writing this kind of movie, this person's acting in this kind of movie. It like gets lost in the shuffle. But like when you actually have people like kind of like on the same brand, it could be glorious. Well, or the opportunity to tell your eight different movies in a serialized form where you could say one episode is this flavor, like Ash versus Evil Dead, right? Where each episode kind of took on a different flavor because they were stopping at this place and having this adventure. Like this film feels disjointed because... They're constantly just moving around to different things, whereas if you did it as a TV show... And they're not good enough filmmakers that they can pull it off. You know, like um, like one of my friends the other night like mentioned Waxworks, you know, where like, you know, I think that's the one where you like, people would like fall into the wax story, the story of the wax museum, you know, and it's like, so all of a sudden you're in a very different kind of genre, right? Mm-hmm. But these guys, like whoever made this movie just didn't have the budget or the like... They didn't pull it off. Mm -hmm. So you go from buddy comedy, cool, to like vampire movie, cool. But then you're like trapped in, you know, the 1930s for a minute. And then you're in like a buddy. Like they just didn't. uh, it, It could have been more. Yeah. But Trace, that's the second time Waxwork has come up in two weeks, so we should probably check it out. I was going to say, deja vu. I want to give it another watch. That's that's like, as soon as my friend mentioned it, I was like, and I'm adding that to the list. Yeah, we'll have to add that. <laughs> um, but yeah, overall, though, I mean, I'm glad you made us watch this. I probably wouldn't have watched it otherwise. Uh, that's kind of how this podcast works, really, with me. <laughs> he only does what he's told. <laughs> I, all the time. I'm a good boy for my daddy. <laughs> 
Oh, God. I thought this was very enjoyable. It was very fun. I would recommend anyone watch it if you haven't seen it yet, because this is a just a delightful little film. And I would say also, like, save this movie and pull it out, maybe not at Halloween. Pull this out during Pride season. Mm. You know, like, I actually, this is, this is like, just the thing about me. Every, what is it, um, like, every, every month, you know, I think it's usually July in New York, um, I always start the month with Paris is Burning, and I invite people over to my apartment or wherever I'm at. And I'm just like, if you've seen it, if you've not seen it, this is like seminal queer history. Right. Right. And then I end the month with showgirls, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like after the parades, and which is also like, and I've been able to introduce that movie to people. They're like, oh, I just kind of, it's just, I wrote it's it just off. kind of like cheesy and like funny. Right. Yeah. And I'm just like, you have no fucking <laughs> And I feel like this movie, Vamp, is like a weird kind of entry in maybe not as good as either of those absolute classics. Right, of course not. But it is like a, like, you like now, I hope that your listeners go out and they Google Keith Haring and they Google, like, they search for these, like, more about Grace Jones, who, by the way, if you've not seen the documentary that she made mm. about her life and her, it's like, it's like a concert film, kind of like Madonna's Truth or Dare. And she's fucking fascinating. Yeah, I heard she really is a good things boss. about that one. She is a motherfucking boss. And it's also, she's still, like, she's performs, and the performance video is, like, amazing. So it's, like, an opportunity to learn a little bit more about, like, our multifaceted LGBTQ history. Learn your goddamn queer history. Right? I mean, you can just say it to me. You don't have to, like, beat around the bush. It's fine. God damn it, Trey. Stop watching jason movies are, are you are you busy watching lizzie mcguire yeah you, you're actually, too, you're no, too that, busy. that is true i'm watching i'm actually about to watch the new pokemon movie uh after this so i'm really excited <laughs> what is a pokemon i mean it's not new it's am i a pikachu it's a remake of the 1999 movie but in cgi so it's fine um, fascinating so cecil where can people find you online if they want to follow up with you about vamp and plug something. Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, I'm available on Instagram and Twitter at Cecil Baldwin I I I because I am the third of my name. <gasps> I'm the third. Um, I'm Lloyd. Oh, I'm Lloyd nice. Dennis Thurman the third. No, wait. Here's the real question though. Did you and your father and your grandfather all have the same middle names? Yes. All we all we so it was Lloyd Dennis Thurman. Oh, you're an official. Yeah, I know. Wow, it, it's, it's, nice. it's Lloyd Dennis Thurman one two three. But my dad and my grandpa went by Boots, and I'm Trace because Uno does Trace. Oh, that's amazing! Wow. Yeah, no, I'm 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 a mutt. I'm too much of a mutt. Me and my dad, and my grand, like all have different middle names. Uh, but like, I was the third Cecil. And listen, when your name's Cecil and you've had a voice like this since you were 12 years old, <laughs> you just you just get used to weird shit happening in your life. I believe it. Things like Welcome to Night Vale, which if you are listening to this podcast right now, you are living in the future, and I am on tour Correct. right now. I'm actually not in my apartment. I am in going to be in Iowa City, Chicago, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, I'm going to be in the Toronto area on the 29th oh. of March, mm -hmm. um, Boston, D.C., Brooklyn, Brooklyn, and then a month later, I'm going to be in Europe as well, motherfucker. Living that big ad experience. That's right. Go to welcome to nightvale.com backslash live for more info. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Um, yeah, everyone check that out. Again, I listened to some of the episodes today and I was kind of captivated by it. So it's good. Mostly it's good just shit. the voice. Good. Um, and also, like, take, and if you are a fan of queerness and horror and queer horror and fandoms and all that good stuff, check out. Uh, Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, to learn more about a lot of the stuff we talked about today is very, very relevant. Mm -hmm. Yes, and when you watch that movie, which at, by the time this episode drops, it will have been out for three weeks, you should go back and listen to our live episode on Nightmare on Elm Street 2 with Mark Patton, Robert Russell, and Kim Myers. Oh my god, I cannot wait. You were there. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's an experience. <laughs> okay, well, Cecil, thank you so much for joining us. This was, I'm so happy that you knew this movie. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, it's a gift that I like to share with others. Your plethora of knowledge is invaluable. Mm -hmm. uh, Thanks. If you'd like to contact us, you can visit our Horror Queers Facebook page or join our exclusive Horror Queers Facebook group. Tweet the show at Horror Queers or email us at horrorqueers at gmail.com. Uh, of course, as usual, please leave us uh, reviews or ratings on Apple Podcasts. 
You can get merchandise from us. There's shirts and pillows and stickers and shit like that um, at Tee Public. That's T E E Public.com. And just search for Horror Queers. We'll pop right up. If you want even more content, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash horror queers, where you can sign up for exclusive bonus episodes covering recent horror films like The Invisible Man. We've also got an audio commentary on Paul Verhoeven's Hollow Man for the $10 patrons to pair with our episode on Lee Winnell's The Invisible Man. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, we took a lot of bullets this month. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Good luck, you guys. Um, Joe. <laughs> yes. We are ending March, so what are we covering next week for April 1st? Well, I mean, it's, as you said, it's April 1st, so what else could we possibly fucking cover because we were stupid and didn't program it last year? <laughs> We're going to revisit. Christmas. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, we're checking out April Fool's Day. But not the terrible remake, the original one. And that, y'all, that remake is hot garbage. I find, I, <laughs> I, this, the, this original film, it's such a good slasher movie. And again, if you know the movie, it's a slasher movie in quotation marks. Mm-hmm. Lots it's, of fun with this one. It's so fun. So yeah, check that out next week. And um, yeah, I, I think then on that note, we can cross out vamp. Yes, and well done. cross well out done. horror queens. Thank you, guys. Next season. A bloody, disgusting podcast network. Home of creepy, disturbing, and terrifying creepy pastas. SCP archives, weekly full cast storytelling, horror queers, genre commentary from an LGBTQ perspective, and the Boo Crew. The horror centric interviews. Listen free wherever you stream audio and at bloodydisgusting.com slash podcasts. Get in, losers. This is the Lady Killers, a feminine rage podcast. I'm Jen. I'm Sammy. I'm Rocco. And I'm May. Our podcast is a tribute to the female-identifying killers in horror and more. Each episode will feature us, your Supreme Court of female murderers, discussing our favorite lady killers, from your Julias and Jennifers to your Carries and Christines. We'll tell her story, decide if it's good for her horror, and answer the most important question of all, would we die for her? Join us on Thursdays as we pull on our sweaters, snatch our ice picks, sharpen our scissors, and honor the lady killers who live on the silver screen. No boys were harmed in the making of this podcast. Yet. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, I'm Shelby Scott, the host of Scare You to Sleep a podcast where I tell you spooky bedtime stories full of creepy sound effects and music that is soothing yet unsettling to help immerse you into a world of horror. This is a show for those of us who have realized horror can be a strange but relaxing escape from reality. Speaking of escapes, sometimes I lead you through guided nightmares, like a guided meditation, but instead of flowery meadows, I take you on a journey through your own personal nightmare. So come get lost in the terror with me. Listen to Scare You to Sleep wherever you listen to podcasts or find us online at bloody.fm. Sweet screams.